the city. Let us pray. O oh Lord, bend thy ear and hear thy prayer. As we come before you today, we give you thanks for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. Even in the midst of our troubles, we trust that you are in control. And for that, we thank you for your grace and mercies, seen and unseen. Many afflictions, sickness, and turmoil we face. But we turn to you that you may heal our land. Allow us to be one nation under you, bringing us together in peace and in love. We ask that you look over this great state of Nevada, and our prayer is that you bind us up in unity and in harmony. Look over our leaders and be their guiding light of wisdom and knowledge as they serve as a voice of your people and give them clarity of vision and discernments as they address the matters concerning our state and our nation. Teach us to think clearly, wisely, and carefully that we may make rational and sound decisions with courage and reasoning for the good of all, and to deal with one another charitably in peace and in kindness. Bless your people, bless our state, and bless our government. These and all other necessary blessings we ask thee, great and sovereign God, amen.
Ready? Front. Right. Face. Right shoulder. Arms. Color guard. Halt. Left. Face. Freeze that. Arms. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right shoulder, arms. Right, face. Forward, arch. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night from the lights up above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with foam. God my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Way out in the land of the setting sun, where the wind blows wide and free, there's a lovely spot. Just the only one that means home, sweet home to me. If you follow the old Kit Carson trail into deserts, meets the hills, oh, you certainly will agree with me. The place of a thousand thrills, home is Nevada, home in the hills, home means the sage and the pine. Out by the trucky silvery rills, out where the sun always shines. There is a land that I love the best, bigger than all I can see. Right in the heart of the golden west, home is Nevada to me. Whenever the sun at the close of day colors in the western sky, oh, my heart returns to the desert gray and the mountains towering high. When, when the moonbeams play in the shadow glow and the 
And the spotted fawn and doe. All the live long night into morning light is the loveliest place I know. Home means the valley, home means the hills, home means the sage and the pines. Up by the tracky silver hills, that's where the sun always shines. There is the land that I love the best. Fairer than all I can see. Ladies and gentlemen, Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak. Good evening. In normal times, I would be addressing you tonight in this legislative chamber, assembled in front of our constitutional officers, elected officials, Supreme Court justices, and other guests. But as we all know too well, these are not normal times. Every Nevadan has been impacted by the COVID outbreak. Whether you've lost a job, had to learn from home, missed a graduation, grappled with keeping your small business open, or been unable to visit family for birthdays and holidays or in a hospital room. This disease has touched us all. And the truth is, we still have a ways to go. But I know this, Nevadans are battle-born. We face our challenges head on, and we will get through this difficult time together because the state of our state is determined, resilient, and strong. Two years ago, I came before all of you for my first State of the State Address. I laid out a vision for what we could accomplish, and I'm proud of what we were able to achieve working with state lawmakers from both parties who are watching tonight. We gave raises to our teachers and provided record funding to our schools. We passed sweeping health care legislation to end surprise emergency room billing. We outlawed insurance companies from dropping people with pre-existing conditions. We implemented Nevada's first ever state climate strategy to expand the use of renewables and decrease our dependence on fossil fuels. Unemployment was low, business was buzzing, and consumer confidence was at a record high. And then on March 5th, 2020, Nevada got its first case of COVID-19. Shortly after, we had five cases, which quickly turned into 15, then 100. As of Friday, January 15th, Nevada had over a quarter of a million cases and over 3,700 Nevadans have lost their lives. That's 3,700 families grappling with the loss of a loved one. In that time, we were faced with excruciating choices that continue today as we remain under a state of emergency. Throughout this crisis, we have worked hard to balance protecting the public health while doing everything we can to keep the economy afloat and our businesses open. But the fact remains that our state and our people have suffered in ways none of us could have imagined a year ago. And let me tell you, not a day goes by that I don't think about the many sacrifices so many of you are making. The challenges are unprecedented. We have so much to fix, but we are forging a new path forward. Tonight, you will hear about my priorities and my plans to achieve them, to win the battle against COVID-19 and vaccinate our people, to get all our students back in the classroom and provide teachers with the tools they need to do their job, to get our economy back on its feet and our people back to work, and to look ahead to what's next, infrastructure, green energy jobs, help for small businesses, and the other engines of growth that will provide new opportunities for our people. Through these historically challenging times, we've leaned on the most resilient of Nevadans, the heroes that helped us get through, the doctors, nurses, caregivers, faith leaders, public employees, educators, the Nevada National Guard, and the many others working on the front lines of this crisis over the last 10 months. That includes all of those caring for our veterans throughout Nevada who have served our country. They've been showing up, putting themselves at risk every day to make sure the state can move forward. There are people like Dr. Jacob Keeperman in Reno who joins us here tonight. 
Governor, I'm at renowned medical center in Reno. The team here is incredible. The nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, housekeepers, and the countless others who all call Nevada home who are working around the clock to fight COVID-19. This disease is relentless. But with the vaccine here, there is now hope. But we can't let our guard down. We must continue wearing masks, washing hands, and social distancing. And when your turn comes, everyone must get the vaccine. We can get through this together, but only if all of us do our part. So, Governor, we are here with you to continue fighting this fight. It's because of people like Dr. Keeperman that I am optimistic about our future. And on behalf of the state of Nevada, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Early in our response with no playbook for this historic crisis, Nevada's public and private sectors mobilized to fight this deadly virus, from local government and state agencies to the Response, Relief, and Recovery Task Force, chaired by Jim Murren and made up of business leaders from across the state. Partners rolled up their sleeves and got to work. For example, the Nevada Department of Agriculture worked to make sure Nevadans didn't go hungry by providing over 16 million pounds of food across the state, serving approximately 250,000 individuals per month. Business and education leaders worked to bridge the digital divide for our students by creating Connecting Kids NV. In August, approximately 80% of Nevada students didn't have the device or connectivity they needed to participate in distance learning. As of the start of this month, every student participating in online learning has at-home access to the internet and a computer to do their work. To keep people in their homes, millions of dollars were put into state and local rental assistance programs, and an eviction mediation program was created by Chief Justice Jim Hardesty and housing advocates. The Nevada National Guard, under the leadership of Major General Andra Berry, embarked on the largest and lengthiest state activation in Nevada history, stepping up as the heroes we all need in this moment of crisis. Labs across the state increased testing operations to record record levels, reporting over 2.3 million COVID-19 molecular tests thus far. In 2019, labs in Nevada reported a total of approximately 300,000 lab results for all diseases. The increase is staggering, but the truth still remains. While heroes like Dr. Mark Pandori, director of the Nevada State Public Health Lab located at the University of Nevada, Reno, have helped Nevada scale up our resources so we can process thousands of COVID tests a day. We, as Nevadans, are the only ones who control how many of those test results come back negative. While we are awaiting the full benefit of the vaccine, we have to be united in our statewide effort to slow and stop the spread of this virus by wearing masks, avoiding gatherings, and protecting each other, we must remain vigilant. Our greatest challenge now is running the largest vaccination campaign in history. Despite lack of resources and coordination from the federal government, we have pushed forward and to date we have administered over 100,000 initial and secondary doses of the vaccine. And as we wait more vaccines for the state, we are ramping up our distribution efforts. Our immunization team, the Nevada National Guard, and Division of Emergency Management are working with our local partners to get more shots in the arms of Nevadans. We are expanding our vaccination workforce to include EMS providers, medical assistants, pharmacy techs, dentists, veterinarians, and more. A vaccination mega site at Cashman Field in Las Vegas, and we are coordinating with the private sector, including our resort properties, to have even more vaccination sites as our supply ramps up. We are working with private health providers like Renown in Washoe County to distribute vaccine to local residents who are not typically their patients. Again, let me assure all of you, every part of government is focused on vaccinating Nevadans. Anyone who tells you that COVID-19 is just a public health crisis is wrong. It's also an economic crisis and a fiscal crisis. It has impacted Nevadans' ability to feed themselves and their kids, to keep the lights on, to keep a roof over their heads, to earn a paycheck and to keep the benefits that allow them access to health care. In our first months of the pandemic, more than 250,000 Nevadans were laid off. It was devastating. You know the truth. We're dependent on hospitality for a big part of our economy. 
And when travel stops, hotel rooms go empty, when showrooms close and our convention business and tourism shuts down, it hits our state harder than any state in the nation. That makes me more determined than ever to get our world-leading hospitality industry open and our workers back on the job. But that's not enough. We need to expand our economy to other world-leading industries that can create new jobs and new opportunities for our people. And everyone needs to remember, it's not just big business that have been hit hard. Our small businesses have suffered, and they account for almost half of all the jobs in our state. I've been amazed at the grit and determination of so many small business employees and owners across Nevada as they have worked to get through this pandemic. People like Trina Giles, who owns Grits Cafe in Las Vegas. Governor, welcome to Grits Cafe. What a crazy year 2020 was. We've been in business for over a decade now, and this is by far the most trying year in business. But we're getting through it, and we'll continue to strive and thrive to provide a great service for our food and a sense of normalcy for our customers. When the pandemic first hit, I was a nervous wreck. I didn't know what to do, but we found strength in our community through their support, as well as through the state and their assistance. And I'm so grateful for that. Thank you, Trina. That's why in October, I joined State Treasurer Zach Conine and the Governor's Office of Economic Development to launch a small business assistance program that has been providing up to $10,000 in emergency grant funding to businesses like Trina's. This funding has helped small businesses keep their doors open and their employees paid throughout this difficult time. The response has been overwhelming. And so far, we've provided $50 million to small businesses across the state in Nevada. But we need to do more. That's why tonight, I'm announcing an additional $50 million in my budget for this program, which is vital for small businesses. I'm asking the legislature as one of their first items of business to get this done. Additionally, our own Lieutenant Governor Kate Marshall will be working to create a small business advocacy center to be a one-stop location to help small businesses take advantage of the resources that exist and help them cut through the red tape. And as I said before, it's not enough to just aim for a full reopening of our current economy. We must look forward to the kind of economy that will let our state prosper in the future and create opportunity for all Nevadans. So let me share with you five initiatives that will help propel us forward. First, the new energy economy. Nevada is at the geographical center of energy transmission for the Western US and has an opportunity to become to energy what Wall Street is to finance or what Silicon Valley is to technology. Nevada is already a leader in renewable energy, generating billions of dollars in investment and employing tens of thousands of our people. Now we're perfectly poised to lead the world in energy storage. To reach these ends, I will work with Senator Chris Brooks and the legislature to pass a bold energy bill, establishing our commitment to increase transmission, storage, and distribution of all forms of clean energy. More importantly, passing this bill will create good paying construction jobs starting this year and helping in our fight against climate change. This bill will attract and develop a variety of new industries, including electric vehicle infrastructure, component manufacturing, and lithium mining. Lithium is a primary ingredient in electricity storage. And guess what? Nevada is home to the most accessible lithium reserves in North America. Second, I'm proposing the creation of innovation zones in Nevada. New companies creating groundbreaking technologies can come to Nevada to develop their industries. This will be done without tax abatements or public financing. Following the passage of my innovation zone legislation, Blockchains LLC has committed to make an unprecedented investment in our state to create a smart city in Northern Nevada that would fully run on blockchain technology, making Nevada the epicenter of this emerging industry and creating the high paying jobs and revenue that go with it. Let me also say that there are other exciting innovations taking place throughout the state. For example, UNLV physicists are leading the way in breakthrough superconductivity research. This technology allows for transmission of energy across long distances without energy loss and provides huge 
commercialization, and job opportunities while helping solve our energy and climate challenges. The Department of Energy calls this breakthrough the holy grail of energy efficiency. Third, preparing our workforce for the new Nevada economy. Nevada has never experienced an economic recovery challenge as great as the one it faces now. Many of the jobs lost during the pandemic will not come back as businesses move towards automation. Job training and retraining our displaced workforce as well as connecting Nevadan workers with remote working opportunities and emerging industries will be key to the state's economic future. To achieve this goal, I will be creating the Nevada Job Force. I will be calling on some of Nevada's leading companies to fund, design, and implement training programs to prepare and qualify employees for these jobs. In addition, we need to recognize that our community colleges will play an even bigger role in workforce training. That's why I'll be asking the legislature to work with the Nevada system of higher education over the next two years to develop a framework transitioning Nevada's community colleges into a new independent authority that will focus on making Nevadans jobs ready. Community colleges, together with union apprenticeship programs, are critical elements in building Nevada's workforce and economic future. The COVID-19 pandemic has also changed the way we work with remote work opportunities doubling by 2025. Nevada must be ready to take advantage of this trend, which is why I am establishing the new Remote Work Resource Center to connect Nevada workers with job opportunities across the globe. Fourth, building our infrastructure. Infrastructure creates real jobs for real people, and it will allow us to put hundreds of millions of dollars into our economy. Capital projects not only create high-paying construction and development jobs now, but those infrastructure improvements serve as the building blocks for our state's economic expansion for decades to come. The budget I unveiled yesterday includes $75 million for capital future improvement projects that will be used to launch the state infrastructure bank so we can leverage outside capital to fund important infrastructure projects like rural broadband, renewable energy, and road improvements. I'm also calling on state agencies and local governments to fast track billions of dollars of infrastructure projects that haven't been started. The faster we move these projects from the list of things that we need to do to the list of the things that we are doing, the more Nevadans we can put to work. Fifth, making government work better. While public employees at every level of government worked around the clock to deal with the impact of the pandemic, we found that many of our government systems were out of date and overwhelmed. We need to fix them. This was painfully apparent with our unemployment insurance system. The division was hit by unprecedented volume, going from handling 20,000 claims a week to 370,000 claims a week, a 20-fold increase. That increase created delays that caused real hardship for families. And by August, there were 243,000 claims waiting to be verified. In order to prevent fraud, fraud that would have cost businesses and taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. Today, the original backlog has been reduced by 95%, and we now have more staff and improved systems to reduce the backlog completely. I want to thank Speaker Barbara Buckley, who chaired a rapid response strike force, and Alyssa Caffaretta, acting director of Dieter, for their extraordinary service addressing this problem. However, our computer infrastructure is still outdated and our systems can be improved. I'm recommending to the legislature that we work together to modernize and utilize private sector expertise to help Nevadans in need. More broadly, we need to recover the federal funding dollars that rightfully belong to Nevadans. My goal is to increase Nevada's share of federal grants by $100 million over the next two years and by $500 million annually by 2026. And I'll be working with Assemblywoman Danielle Moreau Monreno in our federal delegation to do just that. Better systems, modernization, private sector help, more federal dollars, that's a big part of the path forward. I want to thank State Treasurer Zach Conine and the Governor's Office of Economic Development and countless others who've helped develop this ambitious economic plan. Once implemented, it will create 30,000 jobs in the short term. Over the next decade, it will create 170,000 construction and development jobs and over 165,000 permanent jobs. 
I believe in this state and in our future. We will support our current industries like tourism while developing new industries, embracing innovation, workforce training, and investing in infrastructure to create a more robust and sustainable economy. And we will emerge stronger from this pandemic and lead the nation in jobs and opportunity. Now I'd like to talk to you about the state budget. I will be honest, putting together a budget for the next two years is hard enough in the good times and even more difficult during a state of emergency. Analysts and economists have different projections. Markets are volatile, business is uncertain, and so this budget reflects the emergency we are currently in, just like your family. The state will take a responsible approach that reflects our reality today. The fact is, the state's financial situation has improved slightly in the past few months. The Economic Forum's December revenue projection for the next biennium is $8.5 billion, which is $418 million more than was projected in June of 2020. At the time, significant budget cuts were made during the special session. For perspective, prior to the pandemic, projections were indicating we'd have $9 billion to spend in this budget. We are in an improved yet still difficult position. The improvements in our fiscal situation are the result of decisions we've made over the last 10 months. We worked hard to strike a balance between protecting public health and also protecting our fragile economy. Here are a few important items I want to tell you about the budget. We are anticipating general fund revenue of $4.1 billion in fiscal year 2022, nearly 9% less than the previous year. To avoid even deeper cuts, I am proposing the use of nearly $100 million from the state's existing rainy day fund. If our current situation isn't considered a downpour, I can't imagine what would be. This budget reflects $187.2 million less than the previous budget, including the elimination of 152 vacant state positions over the next two years. The COVID-19 pandemic and the unknown economic impact required the state employees to do more with less, including required furloughs for the second half of fiscal year 2021. My recommended budget will not include a continuation of the furloughs into the next biennium. My budget also prioritizes the health and well-being of state employees and their health benefits in a time when health is wealth. While this budget makes tough reductions, it also contains smart investments in the essential priorities I outlined earlier, including restoring nearly $40 million in funding for preschool, $415 million dedicated for construction, maintenance, planning, and economic development, projects that will create thousands of jobs. In order to stop talking about our doctor shortage and actually start doing something about it, I'm proposing a $25 million one-shot expenditure to help complete the UNLV Medical School building. A school could generate as many as 16,000 jobs over the next 10 years. Finally, in a time when one in four Nevadans are enrolled in Medicaid, Access to quality health care is critically important to the public and economic health of our state. During the 31st special session, when things looked very bleak, the legislature was forced to make 6% cuts to Medicaid rates and reduce neonatal intensive care unit hospital service rates. But as a result of the efforts we've made, our revenue never went as low as our worst projections. And that is why my recommended budget calls on the legislature to restore the rate reductions to support Nevada families and providers. I look forward to working with the legislature to adjust this budget and make responsible revisions. I am hopeful that long overdue federal support to state and local governments will be delivered in the coming months. That support is critical and it is outrageous that it hasn't arrived already. This will be a dynamic process, but an important one. As we work to recover, educate our kids, promote justice and equality, and most importantly now, protect the health of our people. I look forward to signing legislation that creates jobs, saves the state money, and improves outcomes. That's what Nevadans expect us to focus on, and that's what they deserve. To all the parents, students, and educators out there, I know this has been a particularly tough time. None of us have ever faced anything like COVID-19. Just ask Juliana Ertube. Nevada's Teacher of the Year, who joins us tonight. Thank you, Governor Sisolak. It's an honor to be here with you tonight. This year has been unlike any other for teachers, for students, and for families. 
switching from face-to-face -face instruction to remote instruction and hybrid instruction has been a challenge for our, our state. It's really important to acknowledge um, everybody who works in a school, from the cafeteria workers to the custodians, our teacher assistants, our administration, our front office workers, who know the families very, very well and have been amazingly supportive in just making sure our, our kids are connected. We are all so excited to get back to normal. I think about the day where my students are gonna come in, I'm gonna give them great big hugs. Um, and that brings me a lot of joy and it gives me resolve to get through the, these difficult times. We absolutely cannot wait for that day to come. And we just send a lot of gratitude to families, to parents, to kids for just doing their absolute best. Thank you, Juliana. It is easy to forget what life was like before masks and social distancing. I want to pause for a moment and take this opportunity to give a big shout out to those who educate our young people. Nevada educators deserve credit for handling the adjustments needed to educate our kids while keeping everyone healthy and safe. When our schools shifted from in-person learning to virtual or online learning, our business people gained a new appreciation for the valuable role schools play in helping to keep our economy humming. And one other thing that became even more apparent COVID-19 has exacerbated educational inequities, further expanding the gap between the haves and have-nots. On top of that, the lack of access to in-person learning has resulted in an increase in mental and behavioral health problems for our youth. It's unacceptable. It's harmful to our children, and we need to fix it. The disparities in equities that became so obvious, not just in education, but in all facets of our society, are important work that this legislature and all Nevadans must take on. I want to take a moment to recognize Senator Joe Neal, who is a true champion for social justice, for quality and opportunity, and held us all to account in the work we do here and in our state. We've lost a powerful voice in Nevada. As many of you know, I have not been quiet about my urgent desire to see children return to in-person learning because we will not recover as a state if we leave our children behind. I will do whatever it takes to get our students back in the classroom. That's why we've worked to supply PPE, ensure rapid testing was made available to all school districts, and now prioritize our educators for vaccines. With a new infusion of federal funds, I will continue to work with State Superintendent Joan Ebert and local leaders to finish the job get all of our kids in every area of the state returned to in-person learning. That's the immediate priority, but we also need to look at solving the long-standing challenges facing our schools. Two years ago in the 2019 legislative session, we began the process of modernizing Nevada's 53-year-old education funding formula. We took a significant step in the right direction with the creation of the pupil-centered funding plan. Education funding should be allocated to meet each student's learning needs. The dollars should follow the students rather than being connected to the districts or the schools. To accomplish this, we established the Commission on School Funding, including parents, educators, and financial experts. The Nevada Department of Education has been working with the Commission to promote equity, transparency, accountability, and flexibility in our school funding approach. In light of this emergency budget, I am recommending a phased approach to implementing this plan that begins during the 2021-23 biennium, with only state revenues followed by phase two in the next biennium that will include both state and local revenues. This phased in approach will allow school districts to manage resources to meet the needs of their communities. My budget also ensures marijuana tax dollars will continue to fund education to ensure districts can meet the needs of students during the pandemic and beyond. I would like to close tonight with two personal thoughts. First, I want to thank my family for their unending support, my mother, Mary, and my two daughters, Carly and Ashley, and of course, First Lady Kathy Sislak. We recently celebrated our two-year anniversary, and it allowed me to reflect on what a lucky man I am for having her by my side during one of the most difficult years in Nevada's history. Kathy, thank you. Second. I want to address the division and polarization that is gripping our country. It has to end. It's breaking down trust in our institutions and threatening our ability to solve problems we face. This is America. This is Nevada. And we need to pull together. 
Tonight, I've asked leaders from both parties to join me. We don't always agree, but when it comes to the big challenges that we have faced in our state, the economic recession, one October, and now the pandemic, we work together for a stronger Nevada. We're gonna have our differences and talk about them loudly. But what we must do is come together as Nevadans to defeat this pandemic and rebuild our economy. Together, as one Nevada, we can beat the pandemic, get our kids back in school, rebuild our economy, and achieve true equal justice and opportunities. COVID has challenged everyone we know and everything we are. All Nevada must unite and fight together as we always have. Hello, Nevada. Nevadans always rally in difficult times, and now we must be stronger than we've ever been. Come on, Nevada. Let's show that the Nevada family is stronger than ever. Thank you, my friends. Now I'm asking all Nevadans to join me in giving thanks to the over 200 Nevada National Guardsmen currently on duty in Washington, D.C. Nevada, we can do this. We are determined, we are resilient, and we are strong. Speaker Frierson, thank you for hosting us in the Nevada Assembly Chambers today. Thank you all. God bless you. And let's get back to work. Hello, I'm Dr. Robin Titus, the Assembly Republican leader, delivering this response to Governor Sisolak's State of the State message. I'm addressing you at the foothills of the stunning Sierra Nevada mountains from Douglas County, socially distanced. I would also like to thank those who are always so close in our hearts and minds, our military and our veterans. Nevada is committed to our military. We strive to be the most veteran-friendly state in the nation. And as a wife of a former sheriff, I also extend a special thank you to all law enforcement and first responders. On behalf of all Nevadans, thank you for serving our communities and our state. 2020 has been a contentious and challenging for, year for Nevadans. We have adapted and bravely met challenges thrown our way, and the Battleborn State remains resilient. This past year has brought stories of loss, despair, and heartbreak, while tales of neighborly love, support, and humanity offer solace and buoyancy. Everyday heroes emerged from our communities, even when the virus was barely understood. As a seasoned family practice doctor, I'm still amazed by the bravery of healthcare workers and first responders putting their own lives at risk, exposing themselves to the virus every day just to take care of the rest of us. We owe our gratitude to the grocery store workers keeping our shelves stocked, the farmers and ranchers keeping food on our tables, the gas station attendants and truck drivers, and postmen and women who keep delivering the volunteers who helped work at food banks and donated their time, money, and effort to help our vulnerable populations and so many others. Through the sheer innovation and perseverance of everyday people, we have survived. Today, I will discuss our priorities of immunizing and improving healthcare access across Nevada, prioritizing our children's education, rebuilding our economy, maintaining open and transparent government, and enacting meaningful election reform. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed the fault lines of our healthcare system. This is allowing us to implement common sense reforms that will provide equitable and accessible healthcare to all Nevadans. We are lucky to have the best of the best healthcare professionals in the nation and are proud to see how they have kept Nevadans safe and healthy. However, we simply do not have enough. A recent study by the University of Nevada and the American Association of Medical Colleges shows Nevada ranks 48th in the country for the number of primary care physicians per 100,000 people. We must expand our healthcare workforce to provide efficient and affordable healthcare to all communities. That's why Republicans will continue to bring forth solutions that keep our doctors in Nevada by removing burdensome regulations and creating incentives for new doctors. Our medical professionals should be given the same benefits of protection from civil liability that we offer our business community. They deserve this for risking their own well-being to put patients first during the pandemic. Our healthcare crisis goes beyond the pandemic itself. Opioid abuse and mental health problems continue to devastate the lives of many Nevadans. We can't ignore these issues, but we also shouldn't exacerbate the problem through restrictive policies. Education is the most important foundation for bettering the lives of every Nevada child who all deserve the opportunity of a quality education. 
However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and our efforts to keep Nevada families safe, education priorities were disrupted. To, to prevent kids falling further behind, a Herculean effort was undertaken by Connecting Kids Nevada to provide reliable internet access to students across the state. Through the public-private partnership, nearly half a million students across all state counties now have internet access. Our efforts to respond quickly through remote learning are a short-term solution. And if we are to minimize the achievement gap, we must get our kids back in the classroom. The lack of continuity and uncertainty has led parents to explore options that better fit their kids' learning experience. We strongly believe that zip code should not determine life outcome and a one-size-fits-all policy is hurtful. Our education system can rise to the occasion and give families options so they can find an education that best fits their needs. Kids should not be trapped in failing schools. The pandemic has demonstrated just how valuable good teachers are to society, and we need to have incentives and compensation to reward them. Education doesn't end at high school or college. Skilled workforce training and higher and technical education options are the foundation of providing well-paying careers in both urban and rural areas. As more companies continue making Nevada their home, we must ensure we are training for the jobs of tomorrow. Workforce development and investment is critical for Nevada to be competitive. Mining provides some of the best paying jobs in the state and not only in rural Nevada. To broaden awareness of the industry, mining is partnering with workforce development agencies to ensure that all Nevadans are aware of the many career opportunities available to them, as well as partnership with groups like First Nevada that are helping young students prepare for the emerging, emerging science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM jobs. Finding an equitable and balanced solution that protects our vulnerable populations and gives Nevadans the right to work and provides for their families is a challenge we still struggle with today. The state of Nevada once had the fastest growing economy in the country. Then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and created both a health and economic crisis. Our understanding of the virus has come a long way since the initial two week shutdown when our state and nation tried to slow the spread and flatten the curve nearly a year ago. It is necessary to keep our state open for business and to get unemployed or underemployed people back to work. We must safeguard livelihoods by using our knowledge of spread mitigation and workforce vaccine integration. We have to protect existing industries like mining and tourism through sound policies that encourage innovation and spur job growth. Mining is a bedrock of our economy and we are proud to have some of the safest and most environmentally responsible mining operators in the world. Our tourism industry sees millions of visitors a year and provides good paying jobs to thousands of Nevadans. The Silver State has led the nation in gaming's regulatory framework and the innovation exhibited by the industry. We must resist effort to raise taxes on the backs of businesses. Attempting to manipulate the Nevada's complex tax structure via ballot initiatives is both irresponsible and short-sighted and will hurt Nevada families. Since mid-March, when businesses were ordered shut down, our unemployment system started to fail thousands of Nevadans, worsening fi their financial instability. The first round of blanket restrictions in the spring had devastating impact on Nevada's infrastructure, and this is still felt today. Dieter's unemployment system was inefficient and insecure. As a result, between 133,000 and 185,000 fraudulent jobless claims were filed which cost taxpayers millions of dollars. A recent study found that 60% of business closures due to COVID-19 are permanent. Harsher restrictions will once again cause declining sales and revenue for local businesses and increase unemployment. Our state cannot afford this. Any blanket government shutdown is not sustainable and threatens the livelihood of many Nevadans still trying to recover from the first mandatory shutdown. Employers and businesses play an important role in our communities. We need to continue focusing resources in growing business and creating jobs without overbearing government interference in a safe and responsible manner. We will always fight for a tax-friendly business environment to attract new and innovative, high-paying, permanent jobs to our state and promote small business growth. From aerospace, information technology, manufacturing, and logistics, energy, and other emerging industries, 
Nevada should continue to provide opportunities for those with a dream, talent, and work ethic to achieve. We saw the limitations our state faced as it responded to the crisis. The challenges needed to keep our economy going and to keep our people safe were evident. From draconian policies that decimated our private sector to the mismanagement of government agencies that failed to provide individuals with much needed resources, we saw areas that need improvement. We believe in an effective and accountable government that will work in coordination with the private sector to provide a working framework and remain answerable to Nevadans. That includes a budget process that prioritizes transparency, accountability, and open communication between community and industry leaders. Checks and balances among the three branches of government are essential for a transparent and collaborative government. Unilateral laws that bypass legislative bodies create restrictive policies that only further damage our already struggling economy. Republicans will continue to fight for limited government, individual liberty, and policies that will allow our businesses to thrive and our citizens to earn a living. During the upcoming legislative session, we must rein in the overreach of our state government and safeguard individual liberty. Confidence in our electoral integrity has reached an all-time low. This is troubling because voting is a pressure relief valve that maintains stability and peace in a democracy by keeping politicians accountable. But for it to work, the citizenry must trust only legitimate votes are counted. Votes are the currency of our democratic republic and must be respected. Every Nevadan who casts a ballot deserves assurance that their vote will not be nullified by a fraudulently cast vote. That's why Republicans are pushing a slate of new bills to restore electoral confidence in the silver state democratic process. State legislatures are the proper vehicle to redress the loss of electoral trust, and we must work in a bipartisan way to enact election reform. All eyes were on Nevada's ballot processing that dragged on long after polls had closed. We must study states who excelled at secure processing and tabulation. Florida, haunted by the president's election of 2000, processed over 11 million votes in four hours and enabled the Associated Press to call the state of Florida for President Trump at half an hour past midnight on election night. This is the standard we must emulate. This year, we will be conducting redistricting. It is our duty to give the public a fair and transparent process devoid of special interest and gerrymandering. Constituents of all legislative districts deserve a seat at the table. This year, as elected representatives and civic leaders in Nevada, now more than ever, we shall resolve to conduct ourselves better than what we see in Washington, to leave the paralyzing hyper-partisanship at the door and to work together across the aisle, not as Democrats and Republicans, but as Americans and Nevadans. We must return to civil debate and open and honest discourse, which is a foundation of good governance. Together, let us lead by example and conduct ourselves with honor, respect, and dignity. Lastly, I would like to honor two Nevadans that recently passed away, Nevada business titan Sheldon Adelson and Judge Stephen Elliott. They will truly be missed. Our condolences to Mary Adelson and Mindy Elliott. May God bless you. May God bless our men and women in uniform. May God bless America. And may God bless the great state of Nevada. May God keep us healthy, unified, and prosperous. Thank you, and stay strong.